wait is finally over for MacBook fans who are in dire need of an upgrade from their aging computers. It's not gonna come cheap. The 13 inch base model MacBook Pro, which I have here, has a $200 upcharge over the older model. Price aside, it has a slimmer design, a faster processor, and a touch bar. But is it really worth the upgrade? Well, if you're a Mac fan, you're probably not gonna like what I have to say. This is still one of the most well-made laptops on the market, and I say this as a predominantly Windows PC user. The glowing Apple on the back may be gone, but it's still a beautiful unibody design with no seams. The new version is slimmer and trimmer, reducing its weight to 3.02 pounds from 3.48, while thickness dropped from 0.71 inches to 0.59. But here's the thing, if anything goes wrong, good luck getting it fixed after your warranty expires. Nothing is replaceable or swappable, including the storage. Now, if you're an environmentalist, stay away from this laptop. According to Wired, there's tons of glue connecting the glass to the aluminum, which makes it nearly impossible to recycle. Think of the MacBook Pro as a really big iPhone. Now let's talk about the port situation. It doesn't come with the USB ports that most people are used to, but instead has the more modern USB Type-C Thunderbolt 3 ports. There's four of them. Two of them are capable of speeds of up to 40 gigabits a second, and the other two max out at 10. Right now, it's a pain in the butt only having USB Type-C ports. It means we're forced to carry lots of dongles in order to connect the things we wanna use on a daily basis. Don't be surprised if you have to shell out an extra $200 on dongles. Now, don't get me wrong, these ports are versatile and fast. They can be used to charge your laptop, bandwidth is not an issue, so hooking up fast SSDs is fine, and you can connect multiple monitors. But this is supposed to be a professional machine first, and it lacks the most important port most professionals use, which is an SD card slot. That's again another dongle and inconvenience. Plus Apple prides itself in making things easier for consumers, but this just makes it significantly harder. For example, how am I supposed to charge my iPhone, which is an Apple product? I have to go out and buy a dongle for that too. Now I'm okay with killing older USB ports to push things forward for better USB ports, but all ports don't need to go, at least just yet. Okay, let's go back to something nice for a second, and that's the display. It's a 13.3 inch IPS display with a resolution of 2560 by 1600. So you get about 227 pixels per inch. The colors are vibrant, warm, and images look lifelike. There's 500 nits of brightness, and it showcases 100% sRGB. This means images and videos on the web will look its best. Adobe RGB is quite high too at 88% compared to the QHD Plus display on the XPS 13 that sits at 77. So this monitor still sits among the best laptop displays for professional work. The keyboard is not my favorite, even with the updated butterfly switches. The key travel distance is too shallow at 0.5 millimeters, but you do get used to it and you won't make more typos than you would on other keyboards. It's just that it doesn't feel as comfortable as other laptops that I've tested this year. The touchpad below is bigger than ever before and now takes up more space on the deck. Apple hands down still makes the best touchpad, especially when it comes to scrolling, accuracy, and multi-gestures. However, the click is now done by using force touch instead of a physical one. It's not bad, it's fine, but I still prefer the physical click of the touchpad like on the Dell XPS 15. Above the keyboard is the touch bar, an OLED strip that spans across the MacBook with Touch ID. It looks nice, the blacks are inky, and adapts to whatever app you're using by providing you with different functions specific to that application. However, the experience is poor. For example, in Safari, I can play, pause, and scroll through a video on YouTube, but on Chrome, it doesn't work at all. In Google Docs and Gmail using Chrome, there are no word suggestions, but when I switch back to using Safari, Gmail worked, but Google Docs didn't. I also noticed that the suggestions couldn't keep up with my typing and were often quite delayed. To be honest, I don't see the benefit of using the touch bar when suggestions pop up on the screen as you type. It's a lot easier to hit the enter key to select the suggestion than break away from typing and press it on the touch bar. Now, I don't think it's completely useless. It's nice to scrub through your timeline and final cut, but I just feel it's a major work in progress and will always be a half measure compared to using an actual touchscreen. I'm not gonna count it out just yet, but I will wait and see what developers bring to the table. Two speaker grills span the sides of the MacBook Pro, but don't be fooled, the speakers are not the same length. This is more of a cosmetic choice to keep symmetry. 
the speakers only take up a small portion of that space. Either way, it's not a big deal because the sound is phenomenal. At full blast, there's no distortion, the highs are crisp, the mids sound good, and there's even a little bass. I have the entry-level model i5-6267U dual-core processor, which is using the last-gen Skylake architecture. It's really a shame Apple couldn't stick the new Cabby Lake processors in here. The performance is similar to popular Windows laptops that are priced under $1,000. It's fast enough for everyday tasks like checking your email, browsing the web, and writing documents. But don't expect to run any heavy intensive applications. The computer is just not powerful enough. Gaming is still a no-go, and if you can game on it, expect to lower the settings to obtain decent frame rates. For example, I ran Heroes of the Storm and averaged around 40 to 50 frames per second with settings set to medium and the resolution significantly lowered. But what is really fast is the storage drive speeds. Based on Blackmagic design, I was getting write speeds of 1.36 gigabytes a second and read speeds of two gigabytes, which is the absolute limit for Blackmagic. It's a PCIe drive, so these speeds are expected. Booting up your computer, loading applications, and copying files are all extremely fast. The battery size has been reduced from a 75 watt hour battery to a 55 watt hour battery with a touch bar version. That's a big drop in size. Apple claims the same battery life of 10 hours, but I was getting around eight hours before needing to plug in. It's still good and will last you through the entire day, but it's not as good as it used to be. So here are my closing thoughts. Should you buy the MacBook Pro? And the short answer is no, even if you prefer Macs. It's not that this is a bad laptop, it's good. It's just that at $1,800 US, it should be offering you a lot more while improving your experience rather than inconveniencing it. Sure, it has a gorgeous display, great sound, good touchpad, and fast hard drive speeds, but it just cuts too much of the professional stuff. Apple seems to have switched its direction with the MacBook Pro line from a professional machine for creatives to a high-end media consumption device. So here's the bottom line. If you're a Final Cut user, then this is your only option for an upgrade. And I get why you'd want to stick with a Mac. Those render times are delicious. For everyone else, this is a great time to check out a Windows laptop. And if that's not an option, buy an older model or the entry MacBook Pro with no touch bar. The performance difference is not that significant. For me, I'm returning this oversized iPad Pro Plus to the Apple Store. So that wraps up my review of the MacBook Pro 13 inch. Let me know what you guys think of it in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to hit that like button. If you're new to the channel, subscribe. And as always, I will see you in the next video.